I'm Chelsea Butler, executive editor of KBB, and this is another episode of our podcast on everything to do with the kitchen and bath industry from the tap. Today, I'm welcoming designer Meredith Weiss, who's the owner of Comac New York-based Mary Interiors. We will be getting an exclusive rundown of the innovative design solution she's come up with over the years during her career. Welcome, Meredith, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, I still think about all the cool things you shared with me in the design of your own kitchen a year or so ago. And so I know this is a topic specially designed for you. Oh, perfect. I'm <laughs> glad you uh, thought of me for this too. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start out by you telling us how you feel organization and less clutter in a kitchen or bath cater to the idea of health and well being in the home. I love the idea of everyone paring down a little bit more. If you notice that when people are thinking of less clutter, they're often thinking of their, their closet, for instance, or clutter on the countertop in their kitchen or bathroom. And once they have decluttered, you can always see in their face just how um, elevated their mood is, how much freer they are overall. So I do always love to say to people before we even begin the project, to think about all of the items that they can take out of their kitchen. Oftentimes people have dupes or triples of items like spatulas. How many spatulas do you need? How many sets of tongues do you need? How many sets? They'll say, oh, you know, I actually haven't used this in two years, three years, but yet it takes up space. And that space is not just about the organizational space, but it's also the emotional space because you're always having to move it and find a, another spot for it. You're digging for things. It becomes a little stressful when you are cooking or creating something, you can't quickly grab something, it becomes almost like an emotional um, attachment to these things that are just in your way of being productive. So I think that alleviating that in general and just having a little bit more of a, spare, a spa, sparse um, amount of things, whether it's on your counter, in your drawers, whatever, you can function better. And that brings a certain amount of mental clarity. I feel like you're, I know that it is when I'm working before I uh, sit down to order a kitchen, let's say, or sit down to design something. I like to have a very clean surface. I like everything to be ordered, uh, organized so that I can, and orderly so that I can um, think clear. And I think that a lot of people, once they've gone through that declutter, they, realize just how um, stressful or distracting that is. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I remember having that discussion with you about your own kitchen when we talked about that. And so whenever we're talking about wellness, I always make sure to add that part of it into it because it makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I think the visual clutter for me, um, uh, first of all, I'm dyslexic. So when things are out of order, I feel it that it's just harder to navigate through. But I also find for my clients, when I'm talking to them about their new space, they're like, oh, everything has a spot. There's, it's so nice because it's this, it's because of that, that they can um, move better or find things easier or um, are more inspired to do things because they're not navigating through drawers and having to grab things and can't find it. And then they have, you know, it just eases everything to be a little bit more relaxed. And I also think that when that is occurring, more anxious to get cooking and get going because it doesn't feel so much as a task or that a chore. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's go to talking about storage. What are, your, what are some of your clever solutions where that is concerned? Well, tote kit drawers seem to be for me like my major go-to. Um, they weren't that popular years ago, but I started implementing them anyway, little by little. And the reactions I get when I add that, um, because most cabinet lines, I would imagine at this point can offer that or is easily uh, obtained, um, gives you this extra storage that you wouldn't have thought of for small things. It's, it, usually I find that there's harder places to find storage for the little things. So it doesn't, again, get lost in a drawer or um, lost in a cabinet, or falling off of a shelf. So I have uh, cutting boards that I use in the toe kick drawers. I have 
my taco shell holders in there, my olive trays in there, other cutting boards and cheese trays that go into that space. There's lots of things that you don't necessarily use on every day, but you do use often enough and they're out of the way. So placemats also. Uh, I know that we've spoken before about having children involved in the kitchen area. So if there are a couple of drawers specific for the tasks that they would potentially get involved in, such as setting the table, these are easily accessible to them because it's right at the floor. So they're not climbing on anything. You're not necessarily having to help them to get these things. I just recently ordered myself a custom cabinet that's going to go in the hallway down into my pantry area that is between the studs as an additional spice rack. I have a thing for spices of all kinds from all um, ends of the world. And there's never going to be enough storage, but when I can steal a little extra storage in an area that when I'm cooking specific to culture, um, I can easily grab. So I took this little space between the studs, I'm putting in a cabinet recess, just like you would like a medicine cabinet. So I think that the space between the studs is not something that's used these days in kitchens so much in a main kitchen. But if you went back into kitchens from the 60s or 70s and possibly even the 50s, you'll see that a lot of the older kitchens had these things between the studs in the backsplash area. It was something I was talking about in one of my kitchen and bath groups of hoping that that will come back. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> I don't have probably as many spices as you do, but I do have quite a few. Yeah, I have a little, I have an addiction to spices. When I go to a store or I go, you know, traveling, when they have certain flavors that you can't find anywhere else you've never seen before, or it's just, I love the bottles that they come in. I love the different smells that you can, of course, create when you're cooking. It's just nice. Yeah, farmer's markets are good for that kind of stuff too. Yeah, I actually bought a bunch of little <laughs> jars so that I can neatly organize them. And one of the organizational things that I was taught as a child from my mother was that if you keep your spices in alphabetical order, it also assists in making cooking and finding things much easier. Oh well, yeah, that makes sense. And finding them at the store, because that's hard. <laughs> and that they too at the store are alphabetized. I don't know if you realize that, but they're actually alphabetized. I do. I just, there's so many brands. So I'm looking here, here, you know, it's that's hard, true. But... That's very true. So we also talked um, during our interview a year or so ago about some design ideas you incorporate to make children feel more at home in the kitchen and part of the process. Yes. So I love to, when I'm able to do like a built-in bench area, I love that to hopefully be able to be for them and their crafting or their homework needs. So if I take a boot bench or a seat, a, a window seat, and I uh, use drawers for that, then they can each have their own isolated drawer if you have two children, three children, whatever. Um, and I think that that's a nice way to have them be able to be in the kitchen, that's number one. And also if they have their own smock or their other kitchen things, they have a spot specifically for it. So it's not just for homework, but for helping in the kitchen. Um, I think that that's a nice, Detail. So I mentioned before about the toe kick drawers. If I had different storage for my um, cutting boards and I would pot potentially have cutting boards specific for my child or um, plastic knives that I use to teach them how to, how to cut, which is what I used to do with my um, daughter and my son. I actually had bought them their own knife set that was really just plastic knives, but they had different knives, different or butter knives and cheese knives so they could use them for cutting. So they had their own little um, section in the drawer. But now, at, and that, at the time I didn't have my new kitchen. In my new kitchen, that would have been something I would have given them was a toe kick drawer with their essentials for prep. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there anything specific to the bathroom, like, you know, any ideas for children, storage, anything like that, where the bathroom is concerned? So I am doing a little girl's bathroom right now, actually, and I am doing recessed medicine cabinets on, on the surrounding walls. So it will allow her for her makeup as she grows older, um, toe kick drawers also for small things like makeup or um, her 
things for her toothbrush because the vanity is so small in this little nook in this older home. So stealing space between the studs again, I love that. Medicine cabinets, I know people, some people think that it's a little old fashioned, but I, a lot of them these days have mirror on the interior of the um, recess portion and on the backside of the uh, door. I think that that's so clever and I love that so that no matter what direction they are, they can see. Um, in this particular bathroom, there's a window in front of the sink, which is not typical, but this way they'll have a mirror. All they have to do is open it and then they can see themselves. The other thing is uh, the toe kick drawer sometimes can be a step ladder. So if they're looking for a few extra inches to gain for height, um, that toe kick doesn't have to be the standard four or four and a half. You can make that six or eight inches, which is the standard step. And then you don't need a separate uh, step ladder because the mm -hmm. step ladders for the kids, those plastic ones really get in the way uh, in a bathroom and in a small bathroom, you know, where are you putting this thing? Right. So at least if it's in a drawer, you can pull it out and then you could change it over when they no longer need it. And then you have the drawer as storage. Good ideas. So do you have design ideas for pets that you can speak to? I'm actually doing one right now. I went to someone's house this morning before our meeting and they have two dogs looking to get a third dog and they wanted a spot for six bowls. Oh my God. <laughs> I actually talked them out of what they wanted because they wanted it as part of their island. And I did feel like that's a lot of space to um, give up because uh, the kitchen wasn't that large. So I came up with a different idea, but in that thought pattern, I was thinking the same sort of idea that maybe a, one particular cabinet can have a taller toe kick area and then box out that drawer with a solid material so it doesn't get all mucky from the water dripping and um, their food and get smelly, a little bit more of an easy to clean storage solution. And if mm -hmm. God forbid their dog goes, re redoing that drawer so it's additional storage is really not that complicated. But I, I have also done um, a cabinet one time in a kitchen that I made the cabinets black so they could hide their TV so you won't notice that the TV is there. And in that particular area, their dog that they were thinking of getting their next dog was going to be black. So you wouldn't see that the dog is there. It feels a little bit more like, um, you know how dogs like to hide. They like to go into like their own den. Right. Um, it gives them that kind of feeling. Yeah. What's that? Hibernate. Well, yeah, they have, yeah. Um, they like to be in their own little cave. So when it's darker, it's a little more cozy for them. Um, that's one option. And that was in a base cabinet on a wall unit. So it was part of the wall unit. If they ever ended up getting rid of the dog and the dog bed and all of that, then they could use an adjustable shelf in that space and then still be able to use that at a later date. So just because you've created basically a square den for the dog, you could potentially use it at a later date for something else because the dog bed would still go in there. I love that idea. Yeah. If I, again, if I had a larger kitchen, I certainly would have given up a cabinet to have that because dog uh, crates, which are used often, um, are not pretty usually. And even the prettier ones, I'm not that pretty. <laughs> Yes, I've seen some not pretty ones for sure. Yeah. So what about anything interesting that you like to do in mud rooms? Mud rooms are a great space because it's usually an extra space. So anything that you're putting in there for storage always seems like a gain. Um, mud rooms have really picked up on demand uh, in 2020 and it's 2021. Not to say that I hadn't done a lot of them before, but now the demand for them and the need for them, having a, a place to throw things when they come in from the garage perhaps is really important. So, um, and they're also not done on the sloppy way that mudrooms used to be done a long time ago. I feel like most people, even if they don't have a large budget, will still want to do whatever they can to get built-ins of some in some capacity. I'm working on a mudroom right now where um, the woman of the house has a problem with her leg and needs um, a higher area to sit. Um, so we are doing it at a different height for the children versus for her that's a comfortable seating. 
Um, so when she comes in and takes off her shoes and her boots or her clothes, whatever, she has a comfortable height because that could be made to any height rather than the standard of 18, um, which I think is great. Um, and then of course, people put bins in them for so that you're not seeing the mess that's in there of the mittens and the scarves and so on. Added pantry space often. Usually mudrooms tend to be pantry and getting dressed or changing their clothing before heading into the home or out of the home. Yeah, I remember you were talking about it last year and it was kind of like mudrooms where the everyone wanted a drop zone for their groceries during COVID so they yeah. could like clean them yeah. off. And <laughs> well, that's funny because um, some of the mudrooms are separate around where I am. A lot of them are separate from the laundry room. So when we were talking about the laundry room, which is also my laundry room and pantry as one space, or it's mud room and pantry as one space, it seems to always be like a dual purpose room. So yeah, to have a space in your laundry room, that's usually a flat surface, which is where you would be um, folding your laundry anyway, if you have that kind of a amount of space to have to bring in your groceries and clean them if you needed a clean zone, um, I think is really such a wonderful add it's just such a wonderful ad. So uh, I'm doing another mud room for someone, laundry room. This one is actually a laundry room and um, where they bring their chicken eggs. It's lots of chick <laughs> people with chickens in Long Island. It seems to be a thing. I don't know what that's all about, but they come in from the coop and they needed a place to clean off the <laughs> eggs and then let them dry over this disgusting mud sink. So I was like, no, 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 you need counter space. And so for this particular client, I actually am having a wall cabinet above taking out the floor of the wall cabinet and putting um, a grill of sorts, like mesh grill, so that when they clean the eggs, they can put them back into the cabinet, but it's all going to be aerated underneath because okay. the airflow okay. can happen from underneath and it doesn't have to be an eyesore. So like coming up with solutions based on what it is you're trying to uh, hide or achieve or gain, you know, that's how you come up with these clever ideas. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you've got to have these really interesting clients too. That <laughs> Well, they had, yeah, that was very interesting. But again, I think this was probably my fourth chicken coop client <laughs> in, in this area. So um, they had this plastic bin type Home Depot style uh, mud sink a slap sink. And then they had like a, just a plastic bin attached to the wall. I'm like, oh, we have to do way better than that. So I said, what do you do? And how do you do it? And how do you function? And asking all of these questions helps me to come up with solutions. I'm sure most designers do that. You come up, you hear the, how they function and come up with a better solution. So when I told them we could have all a full wall of cabinets and underneath will be open and no one would see that, that was like, you know, blew their right. minds. That's awesome. And then the slop sink, I now am doing an undermount sink with a countertop. So it'll look much better. So when someone's coming in it doesn't have to be an eyesore, even though they're using it for something that's not so pretty. <laughs> so let's move on to countertops. What's your material of choice and why? And is there anything really interesting or maybe not as common that you've used? So I guess that's two questions. Okay. So I happen to love quartz. Uh, I think quartz is a great product because it requires no uh, maintenance and all of that. It's harder than granite, harder than marble, harder than any of those surfaces. And they come in such beautiful patterns and all of that. But there are times that the customer is only happy with a natural stone and the look of a natural stone, which I love natural stone. I mean, anyone that's in kitchens, I can't imagine not loving natural stone, but not everyone is willing to... Um, handle what needs to be handled when it comes to natural stone. And not all natural stone requires much. Some do, some don't. Um, so it really depends on the client. My personal favorite is quartzite. I love quartzite. Some of it is um, can be backlit or lit from underneath, which is really pretty, just like some of the um, onyxes, which are really beautiful. They are pricey, but absolutely gorgeous. The other thing is that sometimes um, quartz or, or um, even quartzite doesn't come long enough. So I've been incorporating wood or a changeover in countertops. So sometimes I'll do a natural stone and pair it with 
a wood top or a quartz and then a solid quartz top. So it really depends on the look, the size and the client's needs. So although I love quartzite, I did not use quartzite in my own kitchen because what I love, I couldn't afford. And I was still happy with my end result. So just because you can't afford something doesn't mean it still shouldn't be beautiful and you find another love. So how do you incorporate luxury into your project without breaking the budget? Oh, that's a great question. Luxury, I think, when I'm creating something is really about a feel. It doesn't always have to be based on the cost of a product. It could just be the feel. And making something appear custom when it's not necessarily custom, it really gives that effect of luxury, I think. Um, when you're finding something or doing something, even if it's expensive and it looks like something you've seen a zillion times, it doesn't really feel so luxurious necessarily when it comes to cabinetry. Um, I feel like doing something a little bit more customized can sometimes feel luxurious, especially if it's something you're customizing for a specific need. I've done a couple of cabinets where from the front they were they look normal, you open them up and there's a little bit of a surprise in there. And that gives the luxury feel because it is customized specific to their needs. And um, which also I think is a luxury feel, knowing, it, especially if it's only one thing, one or two things. So if you have a kitchen and the overall price point wise um, was pretty reasonable and you uh, put a little extra money into a few items that will really change the way the family will function, I think that actually I could send you a picture of a few of those examples. I just, that makes everything so much better for them. And I think right there is just a luxury item. Yeah, most definitely. So my last question is going to go toward color. Do you like to go bold with your hues or do you veer more toward a neutral palette? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about color the other day and trying to think about how I would even put into words what that all means. But I do think that for the most part, I tend with neutral, but my neutral, someone else's neutral might be very different. So my own living room, for instance, which is, I think neutral is pretty strong in its neutrality. So I have dark blue walls and I have some gray color on my um, built-ins and I have walnut wood and I have a lot of different textures, but really they're all neutral. You know, navy blue, gray, and wood are considered neutral colors, but I think adding the texture and the differences of color is what makes it a little bit more pop. So yes, I'm not using a pop of color like a pop of red or purple or whatever, but I think that there's a lot to be said when you're bringing in um, multitude of colors with textures, even if they're all neutral. So I've done a couple of kitchens that are, for instance, white and some taupes and all of that. And when you're bringing that in and you're bringing in some gold tones some, and you're, you're balancing between the, the cool and the warm tones, shiny, non-shiny, all of those textual elements can really make something neutral, not seem boring. So I think a lot of times people do think neutral is boring. Um, and I automatically think that when someone's telling me that, and right. then I take it to a totally different direction. Yeah, you that know? makes sense. I, when people say neutral, I'm like, oh. Well, I think that most people, when they think of neutral, they're always thinking of like beige or right. off white. And that is, I think, what most people conceptualize in their head. When I think of neutral, I'm thinking of a multitude of colors on neutral, textures, sheens, all of those things. And that's what makes it, it's not about the one thing, it's about the multitude of things. One of the things I was thinking about, and I, I don't know if we spoke about this the last time we talked about my kitchen, but I like to think about a color in how it pairs to the next color. It's not about the one color, just like it's not about the one item in your kitchen because color plays so well next to another color and gives a totally different feeling from that color by itself once it's paired with another color. It's like something I like to do and I feel like is the playful aspect of it. Yeah, I never thought about it that way. And it's, it's you know, surprising to me too that navy blue would be considered neutral. That's, you know, I always think that's very colorful. So, and it's one of my favorite colors. Oh, really? Colors too. That's so funny. Yeah. I think it's such a, it, it can be neutral, obviously. People wear navy blue with white, navy blue with 
um, khaki, you know, very classic. But when you pop it in other ways, it becomes color. You know what I mean? Even though it's actually neutral, just like red. Yeah. Red could be neutralized. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I guess you know how, what it's paired next to is gonna. So a little go side away. note, and I don't know if you want to use this at any point, but like you know, when you think of, um, for instance, if you're thinking of the color red. Now, most people think of red as, you know, red. Now, if you pair red with black or red with white, it's, you know, pretty strong. But when you pair red with something like baby blue, it becomes something totally different. The emotional impact of that color together with that, I just feel is just beautiful. And it, for me, it's a little playful, you know, it feels um, less mature and less sexy. The red is no longer sexy. It's no longer what you envision red to be. And when you pair red with pink, it becomes a whole playful other aspect, I feel is that, you know, that that happens because of how it's paired together. And I like to do that in kitchens and built-ins in general that play with the color on the interior versus the exterior, sometimes adding a few surprises. I'm doing one right now where the um, exterior is gonna be light gray and the interior is gonna be walnut and just opening up the cabinets or showing that when, cause it's gonna be a bar area is just, you know, something that makes it a little more pop of, of color, even though it's not color cause it's walnut wood. Yeah, I, I love it. I love everything to do with color. I say it all the time. <laughs> I do too, I do too. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for all of your amazing tips. It's so helpful. Please keep us posted on all of your discoveries along the way. Thank and you for having me. Hopefully we will be able to see you in person at KBiz in February. I hope so. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.